Mr. Beat presents Supreme Court Briefs. Wenatchee, Washington, 1932. Elsie Parrish works as a housekeeper at the Cascadian Hotel. Uh, yeah, she's no longer happy working there anymore, though. Wanna know why? Of course you do. Well, the West Coast Hotel Company, which owns the Cascadian Hotel, had not complied with a new Washington state law that said every worker should get a minimum wage of $14.50 per 48-hour work week. That's around $320 in today's money, by the way. Wait, that's it? Goodness. Well, how much per hour is that? Oh, okay. Well, that's not as bad as I thought. Anyway, as you probably assumed already, Elsie was earning much less than this. She sued the West Coast Hotel Company for an amount that was enough to cover the difference between the state's minimum wage and what they were actually paying her, okay? However, at Elsie's trial in Washington State Court, the judge sided with West Coast Hotel, backing up his opinion with a Supreme Court case known as Atkins v. Children's Hospital, which said that a federal minimum wage law was unconstitutional because it went against the freedom to enter contracts. Elsie was like, well, the Atkins decision sucked too. She then appealed to the Washington Supreme Court, which reversed the lower court's decision and sided with her. It ordered the West Coast Hotel Company to pay Elsie what it owed her after the minimum wage law passed. Well, apparently the hotel didn't want to pay her the difference, and it appealed to the Supreme Supreme Court, who agreed to hear oral arguments in December 1936. In this case, the court needed to figure out if Washington's minimum wage law went against the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment as applied to the states by the Fourteenth Amendment. Now, at this time, it was uncertain how the court would decide. President Franklin Roosevelt particularly watched this one closely. He had been frustrated with the court consistently striking down his New Deal legislation over the previous three years, and had recently even proposed a new law that would add more justices in the Supreme Court. If this new bill passed, he almost certainly would get more favorable rulings for his New Deal legislation, which is why many critics trashed his proposal, with one critic even calling it a, quote, court packing plan. As it turns out, FDR perhaps didn't need to attempt to pack the courts after all. On March 29, 1937, the court announced it had sided with Elsie Parrish. Even though it was a close decision, just five to four, it shocked many in D.C., to say the least. The court's majority referenced the case Moeller v. Oregon as precedent. In that case, the Supreme Court upheld Oregon's limit on the working hours of women because it was in the state's interest in protecting public health. In this case, the court argued Washington establishing a minimum wage was constitutional because it also fell under a state's police power. In other words, it was also in Washington's interest to establish a minimum wage since it protected public health. And yep, this decision overturned the aforementioned Atkins v. Children's Hospital. When examining this case, historians often focus on the surprising reversal of judicial interpretation by Justice Owen Roberts. Before this case, Roberts tended to vote with the more right-leaning wing of the court, beginning with this case, and then afterward, he tended to vote with the more left-leaning wing of the court. Some historians even conclude that Roberts Roberts strategically changed his interpretations of the Constitution to shield the court's integrity and independence from political pressure, especially after Roosevelt's court-packing plan became public. After all, Roberts was quite aware of how popular Roosevelt was with the majority of ordinary Americans. One writer named Cal Tenney famously called Roberts' sudden shift as, quote, the switch in time that saved nine. 
Nine. In his dissent, Justice George Sutherland even suggested that Roberts had let politics and current events influence his decision to change his interpretation of the Constitution. Regardless, West Coast Hotel Company v. Parrish was a big freaking deal because it effectively ended the Lochner era, a period in which the court, more often than not, struck down economic regulations and restrictions on businesses in the name of protecting contracts. President Roosevelt was certainly happy about the decision. In fact, 15 months later, he'd signed the Fair Labor Standards Act, which created the first federal minimum wage of 25 cents an hour. That's $5.50 an hour in today's money, by the way. Wait, that's it? I'll see you for the next Supreme Court case, jury. It's true. The court became more left-leaning after this case. It's kind of crazy. So which Supreme Court case should I cover next for this series? Huh? What was that? Unfortunately, I can't hear you. So if you could please type words below to let me know. Thanks for watching.